This time it's five more British superbikes of the 70s. For many, the 70s is all about Japan, and indeed they did dominate the European bike market. But the Europeans weren't quite done. Whilst the British motorcycle market had been in a state of collapse for some years, there was still some life in the old empire yet. Courtesy of the remnants of the major British companies, but also thanks to a small group of entrepreneurs who were doing their best to remind everybody that the British still knew how to put things together. And so here are five more British superbikes of the 1970s. BSA Rocket 3 Introduced in 1968, the Rocket 3 was of course the BSA version of the Trident T150. And like the Trident, the Rocket 3 did exist very much in the shadow of Honda's CB750. And while the Rocket 3 was endowed with a much better chassis than the Honda, and was just as quick in reality, it didn't have all the bells and whistles, and the styling put some people off particularly in that all-important American market. And while the styling done by Ogle Design was very distinctive, ray gun exhaust and all, it didn't appeal to everybody. The Honda was much more universally styled, and in that clever way that Hondas do, whilst it wasn't necessarily gorgeous, it didn't offend anybody, and it didn't divide opinions. The Ogle Design, however, most certainly did, especially in places like the American market, who simply didn't like the styling at all. Add to that four speeds only on release, drum brakes and no electric start, the bike looked a little bit old fashioned. Well, in the kit sense, and the kit has always been important, everybody likes a gadget. That wasn't long of course before negative feedback about the bike's styling came back to the American market, so both companies, Triumph and BSA, strive to redesign the bikes to make them more appealing to the US taste. But the fact is the styling still didn't appeal to British taste, but given that 80% of all BSA's sales but going to the American market, you can understand why this was prioritised. Rocket V's engine was very much Triumph Trident, with the fore and aft camshafts and overhead valves. But the BSA used inclined cylinders, giving a slightly more modern look, and of course both engines used 67 by 70 bore and strokes, which were lifted directly from BSA's C15 range. And that Ford's 120 crank was also made at the BSA foundry. And in fact, all the three-cylinder engines were actually assembled at the BSA plant at Smallheath, with the Triumph engines being transported over to Meriden for final assembly into the frame. The problem for the Rocket 3 was that the Triumphs always sold better in the US market, as the name seemed to carry more cachet value, despite BSA's success at Daytona. 1971 would see the final upgrade to the Rocket 3, with the addition of a fifth gear to create the BSA A75 RV. But unfortunately sales of the bike remained very poor, and only 205 bikes would leave the factory with 5-speed gearboxes before production came to an end. The Royal Enfield Interceptor 2 Royal Enfield's Interceptor was around an awful long time before the all-new 650 model. It arrived in 1960 and made use of a 692cc parallel twin and was essentially a souped-up, twin-carburetted version of the earlier Constellation, with the first 700cc model being essentially a US market special. However, from a British perspective, the first Interceptor would be the Series 1 of 1962, which used a 736cc engine, with a bore and stroke of 71 by 93mm. This large torquey engine is noteworthy because its engine was both statically and dynamically balanced making it one of Britain's smoothest parallel twins. Another great feature was the integrally cast oil container which sat just behind the crankcase, a feature which gave the bike the appearance of a wet sump engine. 1967 would see the introduction of the Series 1A. This was slightly updated with a better ignition system and a smart but slightly small gas tank for the US models. The end of the 60s however would see the Series 2, which was a major redesign of the engine featuring proper wet sump lubrication, and the big engine did produce prodigious power, with a claimed 56 horsepower on tap. This may not seem a lot, but it actually sits it just behind the Commando and the Rocket 3, and much nearer the actual performance terms of Honda's CB750. 
But unfortunately the company was taken over by Norton Billies at this point, who quickly realised that while not actually running at a loss, the company was worth less than the land on which the factory stood. So the Redditch factory was sold off, and Interceptor 2 production was moved to an underground facility. No, I'm not kidding. Before production was brought to a halt completely in 1970, and the Interceptor Series 3 800cc model would never see production. The Silk 700S The Silk 700S was produced by Silk Engineering between 1975 and 1979 at Darley Abbey in Derbyshire. Just a stone's throw in fact from the Darley Moor Club Racing Circuit. The company was owned and ran by George Silk and Maurice Patey, both of whom were unsurprisingly Scott fanatics. The origins of the machine can be traced back to the late 60s when George Silk was working for Tom Ward, a Scott specialist. George developed a hill climb racer based on a tuned Scott engine inserted into a modern Spondon frame. Silk would subsequently set up Silk Engineering to provide engineering work and repair services for Scott owners. In 71, Silk exhibited a prototype racing bike based on his earlier Spondon framed hill climber, and so popular was the machine that demand soon began to outstrip the available supply of Scott engines. Additionally, the owner of the Scott name prevented Silk from producing Scott engines under licence, leaving Silk with little option but to develop his own engine. And he would do so with the assistance of David Mitro of Rolls-Royce, but also with expert advice from Gordon Blair of Queen's University Belfast, who optimised the efficiency of the porting for the new engine. And so in 1975, Silk would unveil the 700S, available for the princely sum of £1,355, thus making it the most expensive motorcycle available at that time. Not that Silk was actually making a profit on the bike, you understand, and in fact George would lose money on every bike produced. The engine was a parallel twin, piston-ported two-stroke, with liquid cooling of 653 cc's. The engine made a claim 54 horsepower at 6,000 rpm, which was then fed by an inverted Velocet 4-speed gearbox to a fully enclosed final drive chain and onto the rear wheels. Top speed was said to be around 110 miles an hour. Perhaps the most impressive feature of the bike was its incredibly light weight at just 309 pounds dry or 140 kilos, meaning the bike's power to weight ratio is extremely impressive. And as you can see, the bike is also impressively narrow. In keeping with the original Scott design, the motor did not have a water pump, relying on siphon to move the water around and the engine essentially had two lubrication systems, running a 50 to 1 petrol mix, as well as a separate oil tank, which supplied oil to the main bearings. But unfortunately, with Georgia losing an estimated £200 on every machine sold, production couldn't run on forever, and in 1979 it was brought to a halt with just over 100 machines completed. The Rickman Interceptor now the story of the Interceptor really begins with scrambling, or motocross as we like to call it today, and specifically with two brothers who were competitors in motocross or scrambling at that time, and these were the Rickman brothers. Now although successful scramblers, neither of the brothers were particularly enamoured with any of the big four-stroke machines available at that time, so they developed their own Bitzer using a Triumph engine in a BSA frame, what many today would call a Tribsa. They christened the bike the Matisse, which essentially means mongrel, and the bike proved to be immediately effective, so much so that other riders would ask them to produce a similar machine for them. Realising the sales potential, the brothers developed their own chassis, and so the Matisse as we know it today was born, and Rickman's frame kits would be successful, proving effective in both road racing as well as scramble. In 1970, Floyd Climber was trying to develop his all-new Indian model using an Italjet frame. However, Floyd Climber's untimely death would leave 200 engines sitting at the dock seemingly with no place to go. And so the brothers would use these to produce a limited run of 137 Rickman interceptors. The engine was as per the Interceptor 2, so wet sump lubrication and around 56 horsepower, and with a top speed approaching 120 miles an hour. But that finite engine supply was a limiting factor for the Interceptor. But Rickman would go on to use a variety of engines during the 1970s, for off-road use and on-road use, including Kawasaki and Honda 4s. The Rickman Sport 
Harris Magnum. Harris Performance Engineering was a company established in 1972 by Lester and Steve Harris. And indeed the company still exists today, although it's now owned by Royal Enfield, who used them to develop their new chassis. But in their time as an independent manufacturer, the company produced 2,200 road bikes, which would fit a wide variety of power units, from Triumph's T140 to Kawasaki, Suzuki and Honda Big Fours. Because when the first Big Fours began to arrive on the British shores, the Harris's realised that while the Japanese engines were powerful, the chassis were not so good, leaving a gap in the market for anybody that could provide a bespoke and effective chassis and thus the Magnum frame was born. And while the chassis design would change over the years, it would provide only to those wobbly Japanese fours with a fantastic road going bit of kit, which would prove to be effective in superbike racing and endurance racing alike. Not that everybody used the bikes on track you understand, in the 70s and 80s this was a great way of really showing off. In your face, said one owner, my Kawasaki engine's in a Harris frame. Or something like that, you can imagine the general conversation. What better way to generate envy and respect at the same time? But Harris would go on to have great success with their frames in World Superbike Racing, where they ran the Work Suzuki team and the Isle of Man and Endurance Championships, before breaking into Grand Prix in 1992. So what bikes or collections of bikes would you like to see us do a future video on? Maybe you've got a bike we can use for a test ride, either way get in touch below. Hope you enjoyed that video, if you did don't forget to like and subscribe and of course thank you very much for watching.